So you all probably know that viruses can make us sick, but you might not know that viruses also contribute to about 10% of all cancers. So Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, that I work on, um, infects the majority of the world, but most people haven't heard of it. So EBV is a fascinating virus. Oh, I obviously think so. Um, um, but how does it contribute to cancer? Well, first of all, I think we should think a bit more about what cancer is. So cancer happens when cells in your body become faulty, and then those cells can stop your body from functioning properly at all. So we're all made up of cells. Every single part of you is made up of cells. We start life as a single cell, and by the time you're here now as an adult, you're made up of about 30 trillion of them. So the average cell is about 25 micrometers across. So if you put 30 trillion end to end, they'd wrap around the world 19 times. So why do we need this vast number of cells? And that is basically to be everything that it is to be human and to be able to do all the things that we can do. So you need stretchy skin cells to cover your body. You need smooth blood cells that can flow through your veins easily, or long spindly nerve cells that can carry feeling around your body. And the reason that we can become so incredibly complex with all these cells is because of DNA. And I've completely forgotten my slides. There's some cells, and here's some DNA. OK, um, so what is DNA? Um, it's like an instruction manual. It's an enormous set of codes that describe all of the things that make up your cells, all of those molecular machines, and how they work. And they also tell your cells when those cells should die and when they should multiply. So every single minute, hundreds of millions of your cells are dying, and hundreds of millions of new ones replace them. And that's just normal. That's just how your body functions. But sometimes this process can go wrong, and the cells can grow out of control. So a cancer cell is basically one that has become rogue. It's starting to grow out of control, and it's stopped listening to the signals that would normally tell it to die. So this can happen because the DNA gets damaged, or the mole molecular machines that the DNA encodes become damaged. This can happen for a variety of reasons. Like, you know, we know about cigarette smoke and UV light can damage DNA. Some problems can be inherited in DNA, or faults can happen by accident. But also, viruses can have a part to play. So EBV isn't like, say, a flu virus that you pick up, you feel a bit grotty for a few days, and then you can fight it off. It stays with us for life. And this is because of a property called latency. This means that the virus is essentially silent in your cells, so that it doesn't really make you sick, and your immune system, therefore, doesn't try and fight it off. And usually this is fine, because the, the virus is usually harmless, um, but it's part of this process that can contribute to cancer. But this property of latency has also meant that the, the road to working out what EBV is doing um, has been fraught with difficulty. So this is Dennis Burkett, who in the 1950s uh, was working as a surgeon in Uganda, and he made a startling observation. So he noticed that he and his colleagues were treating a really large number of children who had very fast-growing and very rapidly fatal tumors um, in their faces and their abdomens. And he thought this was so bizarre, this common tumor, that he resolved to figuring out as much as he could about it um, and how the cancer that's now called Burkitt lymphoma, much to his dismay, um, might be treated. So it was in 1961 when Burkitt was in the UK on leave giving a lecture, and that lecture happened to be attended by this man, Anthony Epstein. So Epstein, at the time, was working on a virus that could cause tumors in chickens. So it's important that you know that back then, nobody believed that viruses could cause cancer in humans. And actually, virology was even more of a niche market than it is today. So even Epstein himself remembers that his discipline was considered deeply unfashionable. 
and even a bit eccentric. But when he heard Burkitt, he was sure that a virus must be the cause of Burkitt's lymphoma. So he convinced Burkitt to send some samples over to the UK for examination. And so then, over the next three years, Epstein and his then PhD student, Yvonne Barr, tried everything they could to examine the tumor samples that were coming over, but every experiment they tried failed. And because virology was so poorly thought of, this was even at the, the point that it was threatening the futures of their careers. But then an unusual sample arrived. This sample had been on such a turbulent flight that some of the tumor cells had shaken free from the sample. And so instead of throwing away these cells, Yvonne Barr tried to grow them, and she was successful for the first time in history to grow these lymphoma cells. And then that meant that Epstein could use a powerful electron microscope to look inside the cells, and there he saw the unmistakable image of a virus. However, convincing the skeptics that this was a newly identified virus and that this virus could cause cancer would take absolutely decades of work and researchers all around the world. So here, I feel that I need to tell you that Birmingham has played a really significant part in that. We've been studying EBV in Birmingham for over 34 years. Um, and we found out a lot in that time. Most not most importantly, but out of my interest, is that EBV can affect where the cells die. So it means um, that we know that, that EBV-infected cells can survive better than ones without the virus. So cell death, because it's such an important process, is a really carefully regulated process, and it happens in a number of, of stages. So in my research, I was interested to know how could EBV in, in Burkitt lymphoma affect this. And what we found is, like I said, EBV is latent in Burkitt lymphoma cells. And so that means that only a really small number of what turned out to be quite unusual virus genes are active. On their own, these virus genes didn't seem to do very much. But actually, when you put them together, we found that they can synergize or cooperate. And through this cooperation, they can actually affect the function of some of the most important uh, cell survival signals that control cell death. So what I've done is just a really tiny part of a much, much bigger picture. Uh, but in Birmingham, we are now comparing the changes that we found in the molecular machinery in EBV-positive cancers compared to non-EBV-associated cancers and normal tissue. And we're trying to find ways to target the virus specifically to enable us to make really specific therapies that won't uh, give side effects to patients. Um, and we're doing this in collaboration with all of our colleagues around the world. And together, we hope that we will be able to cure some of the 200,000 EBV cancers that are diagnosed every year. So that's that. But I just want to spend the last minute just talking to you a little bit about kind of how science works. So I became fascinated by virology um, when I realized that they're sort of a bit like windows into what it is to be human. OK, so viruses have evolved with us for millennia, and that means that they've learned to navigate all of the things that our cells can do. And actually, when we find out how that's happening, more often than not, it's in such an unlikely or surprising way. And that means that some of the pioneers of virology have been the people with the most tenacity, th that will take risks and stick to an idea, but also um, those people with the biggest imagination. And this fascination really made me change the course of my life. So I thought if I ever ended up up here, it might be doing something like this. But instead of going to drama school, which is what I'd lined up, I decided to come to Birmingham and be a biochemist. Um, and what I really want to get across to you is that I thought back then that I was going to lose all my creativity. But what I found is that research and science is actually the most creative things that we can do. So you can see this in the work of Burkitt, who was so convinced he had to help his patients and carried out his first research project on a budget of 25 pounds. Um, or Epstein and Barr, who suffered disbelief and failure, but actually had to create 
completely new ways of working in order to introduce us to this cancer virus that even with today's technology um, is incredibly difficult to study. Or the decades of EBV researchers in Birmingham who have absolutely changed what we know about virology and about cancer. And so, finally, I want to make a bit of a plea that science at its best, with all the courage, all the hard work and determination and imagination, is only ever a reflection of the scientists that are doing it. Because we're trying to figure out what it is we don't know that we don't know. So what I'd like to see is more people who know that science is truly a creative and imaginative endeavor and see creative people come together with scientists because I think if you've got all of the different viewpoints of all of the different people, then together, I hope there are very few questions that we'd be unable to answer.